Welcome to the Indian Food Explain podcast by Cook Like an Auntie. You don't have to be an auntie to make delicious Indian food. Now here's your host, Gopi Vajrabelu. Hi everyone, welcome back to the Cook Like an Auntie podcast. Today, I'm very excited to be joined by Danae Shows of Ministry of Copy. Hi, Danae. Hello, thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. I'm so excited to have you. When I was looking to purchase a authentic South Indian filter coffee, my wife and I had a lot of difficulty finding a high quality filter. We actually did order one off Amazon, but it like came poorly packaged. It was really poor quality. So we just returned it. And then we found Ministry of Copy, which is run out of Miami. Um, the packaging was incredible. It was like completely sustainable packaging. Everything was like um, nice recyclable brown paper. The filter and the tumblers we ordered were super high quality. And it even came with a little like postcard instructions of recipes for like how to make your coffee. So I, ever since then, I, you know, when I was thinking about doing Cook Like an Auntie as a YouTube channel and a podcast, I really wanted to interview Danae. So I'm so glad you're here today. Oh my God, that warms my heart. Thank you so much. What an intro. That's sort of how I got into coffee too, or filter coffee, because I was looking for these filters in New York and I couldn't find them. And at the time, my husband was like, you should just start a business importing these filters. And I was like, nobody's not going to know what to do with these filters. Like you need the whole experience. You can't just like have a filter. (laughs) People are going to be like, what? So yeah, that's sort of, it's a part of, of how I got into this and how I started it. Yeah, well, I'm so glad that happened to you uh, before me, because, you know, a couple <laughs> of years later, now I'm benefiting from it. Um, so can you tell us uh, when you started Ministry of Copy and the process that goes into sourcing the filters, the tumblers, and the coffee that you sell? Yeah, um, gosh, it's, I started a long time ago, and it was such a slow sort of build up for a while. Um I was in a really bad car accident. I got hit by a car when I was crossing the street and it was sort of a come to Jesus moment, if you will, with like a, it was like a wake up call. Like, what do you want to do with your life? And it wasn't immediate at first, but um, I had a lot of time to think. And I was like, you know, I don't really like what I'm doing right now. Um, I want to do something a little bit more creative. And my boyfriend at the time, now husband, had made me coffee in bed when we were dating. And it was like the best coffee that I've ever had. And he was like, you know, why don't you start this business selling these filters? It would be really great. You can make some money and then kind of figure out what you want to do. And I was like, no, 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 no. That's a great idea. But like the whole, I, it would be better to just bring the whole experience. And so that's kind of when I went down this rabbit hole of well, what if I just sourced coffee? Um, Because also we were in New York at the time and I couldn't find any more Indian coffee. I had drunk through his entire stash um, that he got from his sister-in-law. And I was like, well, this should be so easy. We're in New York. Like, why can't we find Indian coffee? And then also I needed another filter um, because we only had one filter and we only had a small filter. So he'd have to make his And then he'd have to make one for me. And as you know, it takes like 15, 20 minutes, depending how hard you press down (laughs) for that coffee to drip. So I started probably thinking about it in 2013, um, but didn't really start the business until I'd say 2016, 2017. And the next time we went over to India, I was like, you know what, let's just do a little detour. I found a farmer from an article that I read in the Seattle times. And I just like cold emailed him and lied and said, I had a coffee company. (laughs) And I was like, you know, wanting to come and buy some Indian coffee, but he was so gracious and he rolled out the red carpet and I met a few farmers and I was just like, this is it. Let's, let's buy some coffee. And it was so small. Like I started out so, so tiny. Um, and I'm not huge yet to this day, but like to think back, like buying, I think I probably bought like a single bag or something, a bag being 132 pounds. Like it was just a lot of naivety and sort of curiosity that led me into starting this business. And then I kind of, I had the idea that I would set up a website and people would just find me, which was so 
idiotic at the time. I had come from finance, so I knew spreadsheets. I knew like PowerPoint, but ask me about branding or starting a business. I had no idea what I was doing. It was just a lot of like throwing stuff on the wall, seeing if it stuck. Um, so I started this website. Obviously, it was crickets. And then I decided that I needed to bring it to the people. So I applied for some markets and I got into Smorgasburg. And I think 2018, 2017, 2018, it's, um, anyway, it's an outdoor fair, like food hall, basically, in Williamsburg. So it's a smorgasbord of food in Williamsburg called uh, Smorgasburg. And it's amazing. It's like 20,000 people every Saturday and Sunday from spring to fall every weekend. Um, and so it was literally me bringing filter coffee to people. And yeah, the rest is sort of history. I don't do that anymore. Obviously, the pandemic has changed the trajectory of this business. But that was how I got my start. And sourcing, as I found out, is really challenging. It's simultaneously easy but hard because everybody has coffee over there. Um, you know, like they'll be like, oh, my cousin, blah, 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 my uncle, he has a coffee farm. But the quality is really hard to come across. Maybe not so much anymore, but when I started out, it was a little challenging. So it's taken a long time. And also when I started this, I just assumed that other coffee roasters were personally going to all these places all over the world to buy their own coffee. <laughs> and I was like, well, I have to go to India. I mean, that and I would found a couple of coffee importers, but nobody was doing Indian coffee. So I didn't really have a choice. I just kind of had to go to the source. And frankly, it's the part that I love the most about this business is going, visiting the farms and meeting the people, tasting the coffee, like actually, you know, experiencing it firsthand um, and seeing that, you know, this is like where it all starts. So yeah, I mean, I could talk more and more about sourcing and about the evolution of this business, but that's kind of how it all started. Yeah, we'll definitely get into sourcing later, um, but I appreciate having Ministry of Copy as an option here in the U.S. because even if you go to like Patel Brothers, you mm -hmm. know, the largest South Asian grocer in the U.S., um, they really only have like one true South Indian filter coffee. Uh, with like chicory mixed in and is it um, Nasaru? I always butcher the name. I have uh, <laughs> it, it's a uh, Kothis coffee. Oh yeah, Kothis. Okay. Yeah, which is, is pretty good, but um, you can you can tell it's not very traditional. Very. Yeah. I actually go there in Bangalore sometimes just for the fun of it, but it's, uh, oh, you've actually been there. The, yeah, to... but I mean, the thing is, like, what we're doing too is so elevated. So I'm finding. Um, specialty grade coffee and I'm brewing decoction with specialty grade coffee. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily like what people might have grown up drinking. Um and also how I came into this, my um my sister-in-law is like a purist when it comes to coffee. So I never had it with chicory. I only had pure filter decoction. Mm -hmm. And um when I was doing the market, so many people were asking for uh chicory. And I was like, I am not tainting my coffee with chicory because my my Grammy on my dad's side is from the South. She's from Alabama and she would roll over her, her grave if she knew that like someone was adding chicory to her coffee. So I've always had this sort of like negative connotation, I guess. Um, but I was like, you know what? The business is for the people. Like if the people want chicory, let's find chicory and figure it out. So I sourced some chicory and played around with percentages and... Um, I actually quite like it. I, I would pref I still prefer a uh, pure coffee, but like we do do a chicory now and it's our like number one seller. So yeah. Yeah. It's interesting how uh, there is such a variety of, of coffee blends. Um, mm -hmm. And as I said in my previous episode, which is just about South Indian filter coffee, like all the background information, you, you could just put, coffee grounds in a South Indian filter coffee and it would give you a, a unique taste or you can use like the South Indian filter coffee grounds 
in like a pour over filter like you can try all sorts of different things and see uh, see what you like there's which is no interesting. right or wrong and like when i got into this industry too i feel like it was very much oh you have to only drink black coffee and it you know it's like brewed this way and way out the i mean everything was just very sort of snobby and i think that if you stay curious and just open to playing around you could get some fun stuff and like you know don't shut yourself off that said i don't think i would ever brew like an ethiopian in a filter coffee but i mean there's some nuances yeah yeah there is some variety um there with uh, Bangalore doing the uh, World Coffee Conference, they had a filter filter coffee competition, and like the some of the people in there, like they're obviously like you doing quote unquote Indian filter coffee, but like one person made like an espresso Indian filter coffee, and like they were doing like all sorts of interesting things. Um, so it just shows you like how much variety there is, even. Like yeah. India is not only doing like traditional Indian filter coffee anymore. They're just like doing mm-hmm. such interesting things. Honestly, like a couple of years ago, they were really into French press. Like French press was the new thing. This past March, everyone is about um, the pour over. So it it's like there's iterations, mm-hmm. and and also like you know chai was the predominant drink of the country and probably still is, um, but with the inception of Blue Takai um, and a few other coffee roasters over there, it's like gangbuster. Like it's just absolutely bananas because people are like, oh, we grow coffee here and it's really good. Like, So they're just trying all of these uh, different ways of brewing and really quite mastering a lot of it. Um, it's really fun to watch. It's like the wild, wild west over there. Like, mm-hmm. When I started going over there, there was, you know, Kotas and like a few, you know, like Cafe Coffee Day. Um, and now there's, it's literally like being in Brooklyn. There's a coffee shop on every corner and there's like micro roasters everywhere. Is this um, primarily in Bangalore or are you also talking about uh, other parts of India? So it's primarily in Bangalore. However, I have noticed that, so my my husband's family's um, his parents live in Delhi, his brother's in Bangalore, but we've also gone to Bombay and a few other places. So um, by and large, Bangalore is obviously a very coffee drinking um, culture down there because South Indian, that's where South Indian coffee comes from. Um, but up in the north, like even Delhi, there's a lot of coffee shops now. Um, it's almost like, think to think back to like when Starbucks first appeared and it was more just like, real estate like people can go in there and sit down and have a cup of coffee and like chill for eight hours that's really like the vibe that's going on in in other cities too so there's some really fun roasters in bombay and um in delhi um i think rajasthan as well so yeah it's it's the word is is getting out but also i mean they don't import from anywhere else now so all of their coffee is Indian coffee and it's, it's just sort of like a new, it's a new beverage for them, I guess, if you will, outside of South India. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's uh, great to hear. It's been a while since I've been to India since before COVID. So it'll be oh, interesting yeah. to see how things have changed over the last couple of years. Yeah. Um, can you talk about uh, your experiences going to India and then um maybe like in the you talked a little bit about in the beginning how it was difficult to find people to source coffee like maybe how you've grown from there and how the process is uh now yeah I mean oh god the first time I went to India was Kerala that had nothing to do with coffee but my husband was like let me just dip your toes (laughs) Kerala is the best place God's own country and it was it was the most fantastic road trip like from the north to the south of Kerala um and it's very much like Mexico. So I'm actually half Mexican and the cultures have so many similarities. So I just felt right at home. Like most people are either like they love it or hate it. They have this very like polarizing reaction. I was just sort of like, okay. <laughs> and he's like, you're not phased by this. I'm like, no, I mean, it's kind of like Mexico. But um, so I felt at home in the country. I felt at home with his family. Um, and then when I started this business, we, yeah, like, I, I just found um, 
a farmer I reached out to and he, I, I reached out to two guys and um, I went to go stay with them on their plantation. They call them plantations, by the way, which is no negative connotation. It's just like the naming of these estates, if you will. From there, it was like slowly meeting people. It's a very tight knit community. Um, so most people, most growers know each other within certain areas. And I reached out to a few people in, um, oh gosh, what is in, um, in Korg. Yeah, it's just really word of mouth. And if you tell people like, this is sort of what I'm looking for, they're like, oh, you should talk to so-and-so. Um, but it's really, you kind of need to go there. They, they want you to go to their farm and taste all the coffee at source, which is great. Don't get me wrong, but it takes hours to go from one farm to the next. I mean, we're talking hours. And then on top of that, you've got a guy who's driving you, but you know, he might be like 85 and driving like 50 miles an hour when everyone else is going by really fast. So it's a, uh, it's always an adventure. I would love for there to be a Hertz so I can just like go rent myself a car and drive around myself. But that's the Californian in me. I'm like, I want my car. I want my own universe. Like, let me just hit the road. But um, yeah, so it's it's really just word of mouth, um, making connections. And then also once you do meet these farmers, you're not necessarily going to get coffee immediately. I mean, they're not like, oh, great. Let me just sell you a whole bunch of coffee. They want to know who you are too. Um, they want to know about your business and and um, it's very relationship based, which is what I appreciate so much about it. For instance, I've gone to this one farm for probably five or six years now, and they are just selling me a bag of coffee this year. Like every year. It's such a joke. I'm like, hey, how's it going? Hope all's well. Um, would you like to sell me some coffee this year? <laughs> <laughs> They're like, oh, Danae, we don't have any. I'm so sorry. We'd love to, but we don't have any for you. <laughs> I'm like, that's okay. I'll be back. <laughs> so persistence is really key, but um, it's all about relationships. And yeah, I mean, we don't just source from anybody either. You know, it's like, just because you have coffee doesn't mean I want to buy your coffee. It's, I I like to make sure that the growing practices are, are um, sustainable, more than just sustainable, really um regenerative and like that they're you know paying their workers and just everything is you know more or less kosher for lack of a better word yeah, yeah. that's uh great to hear um and definitely like looking on your website you can tell that you're very careful about who you source your coffee from you want to make sure it's coming from like ethical and responsible sources um which is also like uh, i appreciate that a lot so i'm not a huge coffee drinker myself despite you know having researched a lot of coffee this year, could you go over some of the differences between South Indian filter coffee and some of the more common types that we find here in the U.S.? Yeah. And by no means, I'm not an expert either. Like that's the whole funny thing is like, I have a coffee company, but I'm not an expert. And I think that was such a like huge block for me in the beginning because I thought I had to like know everything, but really it's like, I'm just curious and I'm just trying and I'm going with the flow. Um, but, and really filter coffee is what opened the gates to, um, the other varieties of coffee and the other brewing methods. So, you know, filter coffee is very much like, I'd like to say it's like a flat white cause it's smaller than your average American cup. And it's, you know, you have like this decoction, which is really like an espresso like coffee to which you add lots and lots of milk and we do sugar on the sides whenever we do events. Um, I like to joke that you can order your coffee with your sugar in India. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, yeah. So it's kind of like a, a flat white or an espresso and it's just, it's very like rich and warm and, and like smooth. And then um, the brew styles that you get here, like, you know, anywhere from Americanos, which is just basically espresso and water to the pour over, which is like, you're going to have a different grind size. You're, um, you're going to be, you know, it only takes a few minutes to brew versus like the 15 minutes that a, a filter coffee will take. So there's so many variations, like starting out, it's, it's kind of like wine, 
but probably even so a little bit more so complex because you start with the beans and then how you process them. You could either do a wash process or you could do like a sun-dried cherry. You can leave them out in the sun to let them like the, the cherry on around the coffee bean ferment a little bit and then wash them. You could do a honey, which is sort of a mix between the two. Then there's doing like um, different sort of anaerobic processes where, well, as it says, like, or as it sounds, an anaerobic process, um, which I'm so excited we're getting a back of that this year. So there's lots of like different ways to process the coffee. Then from processing, you know, how you're going to brew it, like what's your grind size? What's the apparatus that you're using to brew? Like it all just depends and you will get really good cups of coffee or like really bad cups of coffee, depending on like what you do. It's like, there's so many stages in the process where you could uh, excel at it or you could really screw it up. So it's, yeah, it's, it's very complex, but also fun. But, and also I will say that I, you know, I did get into coffee through South Indian filter coffee, but it's really opened my eyes to the different varieties that India is doing because going over there, they're like, okay, what are you, what are you looking for? Like, what are the tasting notes and all that stuff? And I'm like, I don't like, I'm just willing to try. So there's many different varieties in India. And then when you taste it black, I mean, obviously you cup coffee, but depending on how you brew it, you can get a lot of different tasting notes, you know, when you're not putting milk and sugar and like the coffee can really shine through. So there's different varieties. And then you also have the different estates, you know, the different terroir, or well, I can't say that word terroir. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, I, I, my whole mission is to really just put Indian coffee on the map and highlight the fact that India does really good coffee, high quality, special Indian coffee is there. Yeah. Could you um, go into a little bit about what you think it'll take to make Indian coffee more popular? I've been thinking about that for like, since I started my business, I was like, I want to make this so famous because it's just so good. Like everybody needs to know about this. I don't know that it will ever surpass like your common latte, like your espresso, um, because it's pretty prevalent. It's I think that awareness will really come from introducing uh, coffee from India as a new region. It's totally untapped. Also, I've had so many, um, I've had a lot of really great feedback from roasters who have tried our coffees and are like, wow, you consistently get really great coffee. Could we buy some or could we, can you import for us? Can you, you know, we want some. Um, so I think putting India on the map in general, just in terms of a new region for coffee, will then allow it, it'll put Indian coffee like at the forefront of people's minds. Because right now they don't even associate coffee with India. Like when you say India, most people are like, oh, chai. Or they'll say chai latte. Which not even. <laughs> so introducing India as a region will be the first step. And then slowly introducing filter coffee is maybe, maybe that will follow. I'm not really sure. And I mean, I'm not here to control it. I just love this coffee. So I'm making it available and I wanted to share it with as many people as possible. But um, yeah, when I started out, I was like, how do I do this? And then it's become more of a, like, just let go and, and see where it unfolds. But um, it's definitely my mission to, to bring it to more people. Well, I personally really appreciate that. Um, obviously, I'm doing this cook like an auntie stuff to to try it. to make a uh, homemade Indian food, like help preserve it from mm -hmm. the from my parents' generation who immigrated to the U.S. to future generations who are less connected with India, yes. um, hoping that we can keep that alive. And I, I think why you want to do this, and and I really appreciate that you're also like trying to make something from India popular in the U.S. I mean, like, there's no reason why it shouldn't be. Seriously. It's just, it's absolutely delicious. And yeah, for a long time, Indian coffee wasn't great. Like, just being totally honest, farmers weren't incentivized to grow quality coffee. They were incentivized to grow coffee, at which point the government would be like, okay, I'll pay you X. And that was just it. But now that the, like, sort of socialistic 
economic policies are are off, like they're way more incentivized to grow good quality coffee. And it shows, you know, like they're um, putting a lot of money and, and time and effort into how they process it, how they grow it. Um, I mean, I partner with farmers who are like growing jackfruit so that the elephants will come by. And then when the elephants come by, this does that. And, you know, it's like a trickle down effect. Um, and there's lots of intercropping of other plants to kind of give one, the soil, a lot more nutrients. And then two, like um, just a different sort of taste to the coffee as well, because when you have it growing next to other things, everything informs everything. It's very like biodynamic, um, which is just absolutely wonderful. And India, I will say, was doing eco farming before it was even like a cool thing, like before it was even a thing. It's just how it's been done forever and ever because it's so practical. Um, and I, and I really value that. It's like, it's, it's so nice to see people, you know, really caring about, about the land. So. Yeah. Sorry. No, go ahead. I, I, I absolutely like, love your passion for this. Um, like uh, the listeners can't see us, but like Danae and I are, uh, we can see each other's video and like, you can see that she's so passionate about like coffee yeah. and the growing process and the people involved in growing coffee and making quality coffee. Yeah. But I, I totally agree too with, um, or I, I really like that you're doing this podcast to sort of help preserve the cooking, you know, the recipes, the, the whole just experience around making Indian food. I mean, I'm half Mexican and grew up making tortillas and like, I kind of kick myself right now because my grandma used to make so many great dishes and I'm like, Oh, I, I never like sat with her to figure out like how she did this or like what, you know, chili she used for that. Um, and luckily I have my mother-in-law Shiv's mom is a phenomenal cook. She has like a little catering business on the side. So all of her recipes, I'm like jotting them down. <laughs> so I'm learning how to make Indian food as well. And I will say I'm very good with the paneer. I can make a really good paneer. Pie. <laughs> so yeah, I love food. So it's, it's always nice to preserve these traditions. And, and do you, um, do you have any suggestions for somebody who, who's gotten used to Western cooking and now is, it wants to get into Indian cooking because I started out Western cooking like in college. Um, mm -hmm. And then as I got older, um, and my wife and I, my wife's also, she's North Indian background. I'm South Indian background. Like we're trying to combine our recipes and learn our recipes. Indian cooking is definitely different. Um, mm. And so I had to learn some new techniques. Um, it, it, do you have any suggestions for somebody who wants to go from Western cooking to Indian cooking? Oh God. I mean, the way I've gotten into it is just like, what do I like? Let me try and replicate that. I've definitely taken, I guess you could call them shortcuts by like the, all the dicing that's involved. I use my little Cuisinart chopper now and I've turned my mother-in-law into that. She calls it a mixie and she has her own mix now. And she's like, this is amazing. Um, Cause it's, it can be very time consuming, but also um, like making the dadka for the doll if you just make a whole bunch and get these super cubers, they, um, the super cubers is the company, but it's basically like a silicone ice tray and they come in various sizes, but there's one that like has these tiny little compartments and you can make just like a whole bunch of dadka, dadka. I can't say the word, <laughs> my pronunciation is horrible, but, um, you can make a whole bunch of that and then freeze them. So when you go to make your doll, you can just add a few of these, um, like little cubes. Um, and then, yeah, I would just make batches of, of different dolls, whatever you like. And again, with the super cubers, just freeze everything because you don't want to be, I mean, Indian food is so good. Like it's so easy to freeze and it'll still taste good. You can't do that with every cuisine. So, um, whenever she comes once a year, we're like, Ami, come and make you know, we just stock up the freezer. But I mean, I can't think of any other, like, what are your hacks? 
hacks that you do? I don't know if I have a whole bunch of hacks. Um, one thing I, I usually do to save time is skip making ginger garlic paste and just use mm-hmm. ginger and garlic. Mm-hmm. I know it's not like ginger garlic paste will make everything more flavorful, but on a day-to-day basis, um, it, it saves a bit of time. One thing that we generally like to do, my wife's vegetarian, which is one of the big reasons why I'm not vegetarian, mm-hmm. but that's one of the reasons why I've started making Indian food because it's easy to get nutrition on a vegetarian diet um, yes. making Indian food. So if we ever need like a protein added to a meal, like I'll just make a doll. Like mm-hmm. I'll have Thor doll, Masur doll, put it in an instant pot and then yep. do a Tharka, add that on top. And like, that'll be the protein for the night. Yeah. Yeah. No, the, the instant pot is phenomenal. She used to have her little whistle pot and it would like freak me out every time the whistle blows, like no matter how I know it's coming, but it just, it's so unpleasant. It scares me. So I got her the instant pot. So I'm like, you have to use this, please. <laughs> <laughs> but it's such a game changer. Um, for and for the pace too, like the super cubers could come in really handy. You know, maybe just like one Sunday, set aside a couple hours and just whip up all the garlic and ginger paste that you can. Um, I mean, my life right now is very much into. I'm trying to freeze as much as I can and do like meal prepping more because I tend to be very like a last minute individual. It's just like my MO for life, but I'm trying to be a little bit more organized. So um, like generally prepping things and then freezing them, whatever is possible, that that makes a huge difference. But um, I mean, and then also just like having all the spices handy. The name escapes me right now, but like the little bin that you keep all the spices in, Mm -hmm. Yeah, the uh, masala daba. Yes. That, I mean, ours just got sort of ruined somehow. But um, mm-hmm. I keep I keep all of our Indian spices in one sort of section. So they're all just there and they're all handy. Because um, otherwise it's like searching for this and getting that. and But like also um, the oils too. I'm Whenever she cooks, we're, my husband and I are very health conscious. And we're like, you should... Sh- substitute this oil for that oil and you know just kind of or maybe go a little bit lighter on the oil Mm -hmm. (laughs) is there a a typical oil you or your mother-in-law prefer um she uses a lot of safflower we Uh i'm trying to find a good like high oleic sunflower oil right now um but i typically cook with olive oil and avocado oil which isn't so tasty for indian food um, but that said, oddly enough, my husband and I were in Colombia and we stayed at an Airbnb and the host invited us over for dinner and he found out she was from India. So we made this like huge Indian spread and he didn't use oil in any of the dishes. And we were like, what, what did you do? And he's like, I just use water. And we're like, what? but it tasted so good and it was much lighter on our stomachs um so that's also something that that we might do from time to time um but yeah i mean just a solid ghee is it's hard not to cook with that yeah if you've got some really good stuff so yeah ghee is easy to find now um like basically every Amer- big box american grocery store sells it now yeah, yeah. I get mine from um, my sister in law knows a guy with a cow, and they like make their own ghee, like old school way. So whenever I go, I bring back so much ghee. Oh, that's a- <laughs> wrapped up in tape and like the cardboard and everything, but it's the best. Oh, that's great. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, well, I want to thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, how can the listeners find you? Yeah. So, um, well, thank you so much for having me. It's been wonderful talking to you. And um, they can find me at ministryofcopy.com, copy spelt with two A's. Um, And then also on social, but I'm a pretty one woman show right now. So I'm never on social. I'm trying to get better. But the handle's also at ministryofcopy.com. We'll be, um, we're actually going to be rebranding hopefully in the new year. Um, But I don't want to say anything until I got the green light, but for now it's ministry of Great. I will put links in the show notes to this episode. 
uh, so it'll be easier for, for everybody to find it. Thank you so much, Danae. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. It was so awesome talking to you too. Thanks for listening to the Indian Food Explained podcast by Cook Like an Auntie. Please subscribe to this podcast and visit cooklikeanauntie.com to find recipes and videos related to this episode. You don't have to be an auntie to make delicious Indian food. Thanks for listening and see you next time.